if you wanted to double your company in a year, what would you do? The other the other key to that is, do I want to do that? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> not oh, sure. Oh, want sweet to. spots. Sweet spots. Sweet well, spot. Not, I kind of... Hey, Pernosos, welcome back to the podcast. We've got an incredible episode. We went in some different directions, but we started talking about sales, which naturally is the most fun thing to talk about. And we're trying to, we were talking to Deanna about, you know, what it would take to double her company in a year. And then it turned into, does she want to double her company in a year? But we really riffed on that for a little bit, which I thought was super cool. Deanna's built an incredible business in the Zone Inc. Um, and it's just cool to see like the trajectory of their company. I think this will resonate with quite a few shops. So pretty special episode. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, getting to two and a half to three million in sales, that's a big accomplishment. Um, doing it profitably, doing it in a way where you have a trajectory, I think is really good and you can zoom out. And so um, I think the other last thing, which I've been a little bit more obsessed about lately is sweet spots. And so we'll talk about mm. that. And have you passed your business sweet spot? Real quick though, Incredible sponsors. Hey, if you guess this first sponsor, we're going to go with the honor system. If you guess this first sponsor, email me so I can send you a gift card. We're going to play a little game. All right. Number one, Fair took them out of the hat. Super color. All right. <laughs> Did I guess right? I didn't pick it. This is for the audience, not you. Oh, <laughs> wait, I thought you were playing a game with me. <laughs> no, this is for, this is for our loyal followers. I thought I, I had... Okay. Sorry. Supercolor is the world's best heat transfer. Made for screen printers by screen printers. They understand the pressures and expectations of running a screen printing business. You know, Rum and the gang are... They really pride themselves on being super fast, super easy. They're always trying to innovate and just deliver the best customer service possible. I mean, they're a true partner in your business. Uh, you know, the amount of times that they can help you know, rush something, get something done quicker. If there's an issue, they make up for it. They are awesome. And so make sure to also use Printavo15. That's the promo code and that gets you 15% off your order. Thanks, Supercolor. Bruce, if you need a solution to improve efficiency and reduce costs in your art department, um, there's Graphic Source. Graphic Source offers industry leading outsource options for your shop by truly becoming a part of your team. They plug and play with Printavo and other shop management software when it comes to steps, mock ups, creative art, order management, embroidery, digitizing, back office admin, and customer service. There's no better company in the industry to work with. They have over 30 years in the game. They really know and understand shop needs and have a proven track record of success. Um, hit up Graphic Source for your art staffing needs. Uh, use the print the code Printavo Pod twenty four for your fifty percent off your first vector step or embroidery over order. Uh, we have um, three, four employees from Graphic Source, full time dedicated um, that handle a ton of stuff in our shop. Thanks, Graphic Source. Stephen, when was the last time you cleaned dirty screens? Um, well, I want our shop to do well. So instead I just buy them really nice chemicals because, you know, <laughs> I'm not the best at it. I saw you clean dirty screens last time I was out there, but that was, that must've been like two years, three years ago. <laughs> I'd love to see like, you clean dirty screens, Bruce. I'm into it, but you know, you shouldn't be spending all day cleaning dirty screens. Easy ways line up for environmentally conscious chemicals will get the job done faster and more efficiently costing you a fraction of the cost per screen. Campus Inc.'s working with 701 and 842 to be able to help them in Reclaim. If you need a company to help you guys with how-tos, best practices, or just questions, Easy Ways team is awesome. They're there to work with you. They work with 100 plus distributors all over the States. They're a great partner in your shop's growth. Thanks, Easy Way. Um, Bruce, Multicraft Daddy, Multicraft underscore Daddy has 962 followers on Instagram. We're trying to get him across a thousand. Um, and if you DM him, you might get a free case of PMI tape. Uh, for over 50 years, Multicraft has been providing you with top brands at competitive pr prices. And uh, PMI tape has partnered along to give away one free case of tape per episode. So follow multicraft underscore daddy on Instagram, shoot him a DM, um, and maybe you'll win. If you mention the Printavo pod, you'll get 
10% off your first order. Right before we jump in, Kevin Baumgart of sales.inc is releasing his second cohort. <laughs> Oddly enough, Deanna Smith, who we have on, has joined that cohort and she's been learning a lot to really drum up sales for her shop. Uh, sales.inc, it's a really cool private network for salespeople in the apparel space. So it's super specific. There's a lot of shops in there and they meet monthly and, and just work through a lot of issues and uh, all work together to help grow their business from a sales perspective. So that's really cool. You can check it out, sales.inc. And you've got to apply for it. And so there's like a little bit of a vetting process. And I think there might be 15 or 20 spots. So he launched his first cohort. He's launching his second cohort. And for those that follow us know Kevin has been a huge help to our businesses and several others in the industry when it comes to sales. So, all right, let's get to the pod. Deanna Smith in the Zone Inc. Bend, Oregon. So you actually sent over... Um, some really cool data, some charts, and there's a lot to go into because I, you know, I want to talk about your history, some of the challenges you've been working through this year, and then I think, I mean, we're almost at year end, so we might as well talk about what we're planning or what we're all planning for next year. I've been messing around with ChatGTP to create a lot of charts, <laughs> which is pretty crazy because from he hasn't a reporting figured out standpoint, how to pronounce it yet. Chat G P T. <laughs> I Sorry, I Sam almost Walton. wanted to write um, in my little thing like it backwards just for you, but <laughs> Chat G P P. G T P. It's the country <laughs> way of saying it. The charts look very similar to yours, but I don't think did you use it or how? Like, wh- where are you pulling this data? And you, you you guys won't be able to see it, but it's you know it, it's sales by year, like a, a line chart from you know 2019 to this year. It's also sales and profit uh, by month, and and seeing like a bar chart growing all the way from 2009 to 2023. Yeah. How do you yeah. do? How did you do this? It was super fun to to do that. Actually, this is all. Um, my husband's doing, he's the number nerd here. Um, he's fascinated by this stuff, um, which is, uh, I think part of, you know, why we've done as well as we have, because he really pays attention to it. Um, but no, although I would like to try the chat GPT, this was just from Excel. So we just had our QuickBooks numbers and then plugged them in, you know, they, you know, downloaded to a spreadsheet and then just used a quick Excel graph. Does, is he full time in the company or is this just, uh, okay. Yes. What? So you still should take all the credit, of course. Like, you know, <laughs> that, that's how it should be. Yeah. Um, and I met your husband a couple of times. What role does he play in the company? This is really interesting. Yeah. So, well, of course he oversees all of our finance side. He works very closely with our, his brother who kind of does some financial advising and then our accounting CPA. Um, so they're always, you know, dialing in numbers pretty tight. Um, and then he also oversees production. He was the screen printer. I was the sales when we first started all of this. So he's, um, naturally kind of, he oversees the production, the steps, um, he QCs all of the art before it goes to production, um, just to kind of, you know, catch red flags before they're a problem. Um, and then he, of course, fixes everything around here and is our IT guy and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So, but his main focus is, you know, the financial side, the production side. Bruce, we need to go take lessons. Those are all the things we suck at. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just impressed. I'm impressed by the, <laughs> by the charts. Um, so you guys started the shop in 2009 after you were laid off. What, what Actually, was that just about? before. I- yeah. So we both worked at the same company, a sheet metal manufacturing company. He was the, like, the general manager, production manager. I was the office manager. And so where you guys um, met? Yes. So uh, <laughs> go work. This is a cute love story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sliding production notes and the yeah. orders back and forth. So um, his mom worked for an auctioneer. And this old equipment that uh, he had actually worked for this company when he was in high school, just cleaning screens, really basic stuff, right? I mean, they were cleaning screens in bathtub, I believe. So it uh, was a pretty small uh, business. 
But anyways, it came up for auction and she's like, you should take a look at this. You've always wanted to start your own clothing line. <laughs> and so he's just like, oh, I was like, just go get it. It's like, it was 2000 bucks for all of this equipment, some old ink, old screens. I mean, we're talking were pretty, you together pretty bad then? stuff. Yeah, I had literally just moved in with him. So our relationship was fairly new. And so he was just like, well, I guess I'll learn how to print some shirts. I think he watched some Ryanette videos on YouTube. And uh, how hard can it be? I'll make a few bucks and sell some apparel to my kids' basketball team and stuff. And it was pretty hard. <laughs> anyways i i could still like envision the whole garage process and how like it's just like what the heck is this and uh then shortly just within a month or two i got laid off which i mean we knew it was coming it was recession i worked in basically kind of the construction field and so that those were the first jobs that were were going um so i just Next day, went down, made myself a desk, opened the laptop, started reaching out to people, started trying to create some type of order taking system and taught myself Adobe Illustrator. And within six months, we started losing clients because they were coming to our house. It was a little weird. And so we got a small little commercial building and uh, he, jo he quit his job within, I think it was about three or four months and joined me. The rest what is the, history. What was the press? Do you remember? Um, yeah, it was a, I, it was a very old Riley Hopkins seventies. Oh. It was rough. Old Riley. <laughs> Riley Hopkins. If you're out I there, we're still trying to interview you. Like a Hicks dryer or something. Um, really old. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot of cleaning involved. Wow. That's really cool. Uh, getting started as a screen printing shop and looking back those first few clients, I mean, was it literally just cold email like that and, and just sitting down or reaching out to friends first? Or like we, when we first started, we used flyers a lot and we just dumped flyers everywhere. Um, and then people would email from that. But yeah. how did it go for you guys? Yeah. I mean, we definitely started with the contacts at the school that Josh and his kids knew. They were always very involved in sports and his kids at this point were in high school. So, uh, there was a lot of opportunity there to kind of do sweatshirts, spirit wear stuff. And then it, it just kept spreading, you know, Oh, you're doing shirts now. You know, I've got someone over at this school. And so, um, in the zone, of course, is like a sports reference. And, uh, that was a name he had always been kicking around and we didn't realize it was so complicated, but it, is kind of so and <laughs> no n not in <laughs> yeah no i just the n you know almost 15 years going on the business like were there some significant turning points where you know i obviously going full time that's a big one um getting a space right on mm -hmm. the professionalism side like big one as well what do you think were some other ones maybe the first five years? Oh, gosh. Well, um, we never could afford any of it. <laughs> we lived off hmm. of my unemployment. So that was really this kind of the saving grace of the, you know, getting laid off, right? I had unemployment. And so we lived off of that pretty tightly with, uh, we're a blended family of five kids. So not easy stuff. Wow. And, um, but yeah, I would say, you know, the turning point, for sure, when we got that very first building, which, by the way, had no uh, water or sewer, there was no plumbing in it. So he had to create like a, his own water system. Um, we might may or may not have flooded the shop a few times. <laughs> and then, you know, next turning point, I think we were there for about two years. And then we uh, had to upscale to another building. Um, which was about 1,500 square feet. And that would probably, that would have been around 2013. That was also the period where we decided we had to go automatic or we had to quit. Why quit? He, <clears throat> Just physically he couldn't touching? physically keep up anymore. His rotator cuffs and his shoulders were, he could barely lift his arms. Um, so it, it was 
what was the revenue? Where do you think you were at revenue with that? Like, how long did you go with an uh, with a manual? Probably about two hundred thousand in sales, and you know, getting that first automatic was so hard because we had no business financial history, right? Worth that any bank wanted to you know loan us money on. So we got denied a lot. We we tried everything, and finally. Um, through some digging, we found some uh, an opportunity through Mercy Corps, and they um, kind of specialize in risky financing with kind of small businesses. And so we were able to, um, after lots of hoops, got fifty thousand dollar loan from them, and uh, with some other cash, we rounded up. That's how we got our first rock. I think that was in two thousand twelve. I see something on your graph that you shared. I won't share the numbers. Um, but your growth from that point, I mean, you've since almost quadruple. It's just, it's crazy the like progression of what you've done with your business since that day. Did everything, like, did the whole world change when an auto came in? Like, what? Yeah, like, talk to us about the next year after. It's so funny. Like, it's like, if you build it, they'll come. I don't, I don't understand it, but it just started, <laughs> you know, I, it just started, uh, clicking. I guess I really tried hard to provide good customer service with people could come into our shop. And we had a very small showroom at that point. And that seemed to be a very positive thing for people in our area. You know, like you're not the first, everyone says that, right? Like the second I got an auto, things completely changed. And my opinion, I'm curious to hear Bruce's. My opinion is that when you make an investment with an auto, and you're taking on this massive loan and you're like, okay, I have to take shit seriously now because I have to make the payment on this. Yeah. So naturally, I'm going to just have better habits in business. And those habits could be customer service. Those habits could be you know, better SOPs, those habits. And naturally, when you start to do that, you know, good things start to happen for your business. And so it almost like it almost puts you from first grade to sixth grade. And you're like, okay, now I got to act like a sixth grader in business versus like yesterday I was acting like a first grader. I feel like my business is like Billy Madison every day. I'm <laughs> going to your grade. Uh, that's what I say. Uh, that's that's my analogy. I'm curious, Bruce, what you've also seen because Deanna's not the first one to say that. And I think people listening that are thinking about pulling the trigger on an auto might might have the same reservations. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think there's two things that I've seen. At least one is the mental aspect of taking on that payment. <laughs> it's like a kick in the butt of damn. Okay, time to get going here. Let me let me like really hammer on the 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 keyboard or I guess it used to be the phones, but now it's probably the keyboards. And then the other thing I I think numerically, which really comes from Jeffrey Paul's thing of of just like measuring the numbers and the little numbers add up. I think the throughput is so much faster that, you know, you're able to accept or feel more comfortable accepting larger jobs, different types of jobs, more expensive jobs, and can get them out the door. And so that just drives more cash in quicker. Well, you know, that whole process, like, like we had to really dive into our finances, right. And go through loan problems and all kinds of things. And so, yeah, we were definitely, it taught us a lot to pay attention to a lot more details on the finance side. So I do kind of feel like, yeah, like the drive for an automatic, like it's not just the automatic that brings the business, but the fact that you're paying more attention to your business and you're, you're, of course, you know, you got that payment on your shoulder, so you're pushing a little bit harder. But also, you know, like it, it uh, gave us back so much time to our lives that we could focus more on the business and less on just printing. When your life is riding on a business like this, you know, you're, you're risking a lot. Five kids, you just bought this automatic. When did it start to feel comfortable? Like when was that feeling where you're like, I have a little bit of a security blanket that I have a company now rather than a liability. Yeah, I would say that was probably when we probably hit around a half a million, um, started feeling more comfortable and, um, we had continual growth each year. So it just kind of emphasized that we were doing the right thing. We just keep, keep pushing hard. We'll keep, it'll, you know, keep working out. So for me, I kind of feel like it was around that half million mark. I could kind of breathe for a second, <laughs> A little bit just on the financial side. I mean, we were still struggling. We, did, we always needed, it seemed like, better processes and good employees. And it was just hard to find. And it, it was hard 
to understand how to like teach, you know, how to pass our not micromanage and and teach someone to like carry it also like a new employee. Why was it why was it half a million? Was that because like a profit thing or you know to be able to take home or was it like the mental aspect of that number? Well, at that point we had been in business for a few years. Um we were at our new building for a couple of years at that point. So it just, it, it felt like things were finally starting to like really get com- like comfortable in a sense that we knew what we were doing, knew how Got to keep, continue growing. Um, we weren't food on the table. Yeah. 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 I, I can't remember. I have it written down somewhere when Josh, when I got my first paycheck and when Josh got his first paycheck, but I tell you, it, it was not for a long time. <laughs> That's such a special, I mean, it's special to do it individually. It's probably even more special to share it with someone like that because like that's such an accomplishment. I asked earlier um, when it started to feel okay. When did it start to get fun? Like when did, when was it like, okay, this is sweet. We're rocking. We're making money. We've got something here. I'm relaxed or more relaxed. Like when, when was that sweet spot? Yeah. Um, Probably right off, gosh, right after that kind of half million mark, uh, you know, that's 2016. That's when, like, just before that, we had started kind of, um, we were out pounding the pavement, meeting people and met an embroiderer in town. And so we started doing business back and forth with each other. We had an agreement, hey, I'll, I'll do your screen printing, if you'll do my embroidery. So we had an agreement there. And um, it was working out nicely. And <clears throat> so things were, were going good. Um, and then she wanted to retire. So she presented us with an opportunity to buy her business that had been established for about 16 years. So, you know, it was running fairly well. It was all, all paper system, kind of a little bit rudimentary. But um, regardless, she had a good, solid business going. And so we we're like, 100%, we want to add it to our business. So that was in 2016, we did that. And that's when it just like, you'll notice in the graph that it just like doubled, or more than doubled. And, mm. and our customers crossed over so well, they're like, Oh, you do screen printing? Oh, you do embroidery? And it just took off. How did you value the, that business or like, know what to pay for it? And then how do you pay for it too? Is it like you used them and kind of seller financed it and made payments to them? Yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, I probably wasn't too deeply involved in the valuation of that. I know that, you know, of course we took into account the equipment that she had. And I want to say that there was an outside um, person that kind of helped with the evaluation. And then of course, you know, um, the previous owner presenting what she was wanting. Uh, and she had a really good client list. So that was definitely something to consider um, that we felt really good about. Um, and she had a good reputation in town. So we weren't worried about taking on something negative. Um, so uh, it was a fairly comfortable transition. Um, but how they came up with the actual valuation, I don't know too much about that. Um, but do customers churn off? Because I think that's also a worry when you know ownership changes. There's such an owner customer relationship. Did or yeah. did you were you able to retain a lot? We were super worried about that because not only were we buying it, but we were moving it. So, mm. um, <laughs> so we were. I don't know. We were like, well, if we lose a quarter you know, this is where we'll be, uh, you know, we were definitely thinking about those projections. We lost maybe a handful, very little, very little because we had been working with her beforehand. We knew her pricing, our pricing matched her pricing. Um, so there wasn't any like drastic pricing changes to the customers once we took over. So I think that was super helpful. Um, a handful, but, like less than maybe a quarter of the revenue? Oh, even less than that. We, we hardly lost okay. any customers. I really don't know what the exact number is, but it, it was small. And we actually gained business um, because they crossed over so well. It was that, oh, you do screen printing. Oh, you do embroidery. So it was, it went very well. 
So this is really interesting. So like growth by acquisition is essentially what you did. Um, but you took an expense of your company and turned it into a profit center. Mm -hmm. And so you bought an embroidery company that was making money off you. And then you turned it and said, okay, like I'll get to make that money and the markup I make that I sell to my other customers. And so there's a lot of wisdom there to, to buy a company in a similar segment that you rely on a lot. Um, I think that that's, that's really, really interesting. I think the other really interesting part is, um, like as a result of this, there was like a one plus one equals three here thing, right? It's like, now we do screen printing. Now we do embroidery. We can now take on way more. And so like, there's this like natural balloon. I think to Bruce's point, the fear is this fallout. How involved was she in the business? Meaning like, was her name really associated to the company? Like, were you worried about, you know, um, if she's not here, what's going to happen? Like, how good was the brand and the reputation? Like, yeah, without her. Yeah, um, I I guess that never worried me too much because her, she had another employee who was like very much the face in the mm. sales part. And that employee came with me. So um, I still really carried the face of the company. People knew this employee very well. And, and she was, she was a great salesperson. She knew about everybody's kids and their families. Like she really um, was great about that relationship building. Um, so uh, people were really attracted to her. So she, she stayed with me up until uh, the pan, the pandemic. Wow. Were there any problems with that moving the team over? Did some people turn off that, you know, oh shoot, and <laughs> now I need to replace a person who's doing this or that? Not really. I think um some of them were happy for a change. Um and I had known most all of them uh because I had that prior relationship. So I wasn't like a brand new person to them. They definitely already kind of knew josh and myself you were the you were the fun one like the fun i'll be the fun boss yeah <laughs> <laughs> you can brag about yourself um and so for people listening about this your company is less valuable if you as the owner are too attached to it like if the business can't run without you the value drops off like so much and so it's really important when you're building your company to actually create some separation between the business and the owner because you know if you want to go to sell it someday, you literally will slash the price in half if you are the like, you know, you could be the straw that breaks the camel's back essentially. So it's really, really important to almost like to create some space, which kind of seems bass backwards. But Bruce, what do you think about that of well, a company being I, devalued? I would almost argue that just as important as that is probably around the 10 year or so mark, maybe even sooner, it mentally is just hard to be the, like the center of the, of the wheel with all the spokes coming out like all the time. And so I think for just mental sanity, it's, you know, is there a way to, to push towards that too? So it's a, it's a one plus one equals three thing. <laughs> Bruce, I'm, I'm curious, you know, Printavo obviously got acquired. How much of that were they, were they ever like worried about you because your middle name is Printavo on Facebook? <laughs> Actually, yeah, there was um, what is it, key man risk? That there was definitely that was something they were very worried about, and so um, you like, know, why do you have a bobblehead? Why do you is your middle name this? Are well, you just it would have been like the same thing as you know buying that em <laughs> that embroidery shop is to like, you, let's say half the people just disappeared, you know. I mean, it would be or and or said that I'm leaving, right? I mean, it would just be worrisome from a customer standpoint, from an operational standpoint. Um, it's like, am I just buying equipment? So yeah, that absolutely worries them. And so they, they, the thought is how do we de-risk? And right. de-risking is the like act of just bringing on different managers in different departments and spreading out the knowledge, like reducing the tribal knowledge from one, two people to a spread out way. So there's no key man risk anymore. And that's the way companies are like at some point, larger companies are, that's, that's how it is. Can we play a game? All right, go ahead. <laughs> um, okay. 
Uh, so I think what's really cool about your business, you've given us these graphs and shown it to us. Um, and everything's going up and to the right. The business is literally like doubled several times, super profitable. So first of all, congratulations to you. And it's no surprise. And you won screen printing, women in screen printing, right? This year? Yeah. Maybe last year? This yeah. Year? It's yeah. just sad. Oh, yeah. Atlanta, yeah. Big Georgia. congratulations for Thank that. You. Congrats. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. So, um, uh, so it's like a female entrepreneur, like you're crushing it. If you want it, let's play a game. If you wanted to double your company in a year, what would you do? I think I would have to uh, double down and spend some serious money and bring in some very key uh, managers uh, and outbound sales need like like some important employees to really push it i don't think i could do it by myself but um yeah it's well, not. i kind of i kind of want to before i get into the sweet spot though i kind of want to understand which roles you think are so crucial that they would double the company next year yeah this is really interesting because you're at a really cool inflect you're at a this is super interesting. You're at a really cool point in your business mm -hmm. where it's like a really healthy sweet spot business and it's like do i want that and this is, yeah, I'm really, really curious to hear, like, what would those key hires be, like, very specifically? Yeah, I, I mean, starting off with, like, some type of a sales director or someone who really has a strong background in going after sales. Um, I think that's where it would have to start. And then I would probably like to see some type of uh, key player, as, you know, over helping oversee the business itself um to help all those moving parts run properly because you know you can have you can bring in all the sales you want but you also got to produce and we want to stay efficient we don't want to like rock our you know profit margins and stuff we like where we're at so we want to maintain that um so that would be a it would be tricky but um I'm still kind of learning that world a lot. Um, I'm part of a kind of like, it's like a mastermind group kind of thing. And so I'm starting to like dive more into this part and keep players Are you in like Kevin's that. group? I am in a couple groups. I'm in Kevin's Sales Inc. group. Nice. Then he won't I, let us in. Oh. I want to I I get in. <laughs> hey, Kevin. Let me send a referral um, email. I've been kind of sending yeah, them referrals. So I'll just send say, me a hey, referral this, link. these guys, Bruce and Ka and uh, Steve would like to join in. <laughs> but, but okay, here's what's really interesting. You are focusing on this right now, which yeah. is cool. And you're like very self-aware, which is really cool. And then like, so you're thinking about this maybe yes. a little bit. We are. Okay. What would you, what would stop you from hiring that director role now? A co is it a yeah. cost thing, or is it just I want to get some other things organized first, or um, maybe just time and experience because I don't know what I'm doing in that world hmm. yet. Um, and, and then and do cost. you manage the sale? <laughs> do you do you manage? Sorry, do you manage the salespeople today? Like, how many salespeople do you have? Is inside and outside blended? Like, what's what's your sales structure look like? So right now, um, I. I'm really trying to step away from sales. Um, I'm in it very little, but I do provide leadership to them. So like I still do the sales and training with my off my sales manager um, who she's a sales manager, but at the same time, she's just very still deep into sales. It, it's been a hard kind of transition to like change our organizational structure um, so it's been a slow process, but we're getting there. Um, so I'm doing sales ink training with her. And then after the first of the year, we're hoping to like kind of, um, train what we've learned to the other two sales reps. So together I have three sales reps. Um, one is just more of a lead or a manager in that position. And, so it's it's inbound. We've done this is the first year that we have done any kind of kind of what I would call like warm outreach. So this year I um because I've been trying to buy a building and it's expensive here, I've been trying to increase our sales. So I'm like, I need to get out in the community more. So I've been part of the chamber, um, doing networking events and these mastermind classes. So I'm really trying to get out there more. Um, so we have taken those people that we have met and done kind of warm outreaches like, hey, uh, I really like your business. We'd love to help you. 
Let us know if you need anything. So we've done very basic stuff like that. And all of my How's team, that worked? It's been good. Like, is it working? I think it's working. Um, another story, but we've lost, we lost some large clients this year mm. and, but we've made that up. So I feel like it's With working. Better ones. And, and I do have like, um, some information where I like, I know for sure that I got this client because we reached out, um, because we made that connection. So, um, I do have some of that, you know, actual evidence showing that it works, but on top of that, like I also converted, we converted over our sales staff to like a base salary plus a small commission. And so there's an incentive there to do those outreaches or send their current clients ideas and try and add on to their sales. Um, so it's been very, very small, but just kind of easing into it because I do only have inside sales staff and, um, one of you, I, I maybe it was Steven said at one point, you can't expect your inside salespeople to be outside salespeople. Um, and that resonated with me a lot. Um, so I'm kind of learning that process, especially as I go through the sales inc training, understanding that. Um, you almost, so this is, we were just talking to Justin Lawrence about this, like literally, literally the exact same thing the other day is it's so scary to hire more salespeople. It's just like, because you're so worried about, are they going to pay themselves off? How quickly are they going to actually produce? Am I just adding more people and they're not going to pay them? Like they're not going to make up that revenue. But what I really think it comes down to is hiring people to do ultra specific roles in your sales process, right? And so you, you said it best, like the inside sales team can't do outside sales. They're not going to do cold outreach. They're not going to prospect and create leads. But what if you kind of risked it and said, okay, I'm going to spend forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 on just someone to set up appointments and prospect. And that's all they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about that at all? Definitely. Um, and what, what has held you back from doing something like that? Cause I think a lot of shops listening to this, this will resonate with them. I have a hundred percent thought about that. Uh, what has held me back is I am still learning the process of outside sales outreach and we, and in, with that, I learned that how important a CRM tool is, and we do not have that in place yet. Um, so I um, have some uh, things to put in order in order to make that successful, but definitely thinking about that down the road for sure. Hoping to, you know, 2024 goal is part of that, just, you know, continue on that path of sales and looking more at, you know, outside sales and having that CRM tool, not only just for the outside salespeople, but my inside salespeople, because I want them to be more proactive and like reaching out to people like, Hey, you always place a Christmas order. Um, are you ready to get that going now in October rather than in December when they, it, they might not get it on time? Um, so having that tool to help them be pro proactive with that type of stuff. Um, another one would be like, we have some retail clients. Um, so, you know, helping them be proactive so that they meet their Black Friday sales and seasonal sales. Um, for me, I, I call that our customer service experience. And that's what I'm really hoping to um, really dive into this year. I've This next year, I've spent this year kind of like, learning, grabbing tools, figuring out how I want to do it. And then hopefully in 2024, we can really roll that out better. Bruce, I'm curious when you were early at Printavo, you know, Printavo has got a really interest, like a really great sales process and sales cycle. When did you start breaking out the roles and what roles did you break out? Cause like there's all different parts of it. When was that for you? Could you maybe um, and and the first, shops listening to this that use Printavo, you'll know who kind of where you were at in the sales process. So this could be interesting. Yeah, obviously, first founder led sales. Um, so, you know, there's no better probably close rate to founder led sales. The, the problem that you encounter very quickly is you, I think we all suck at following up until just you, you really need to follow up. <laughs> oh, yeah, probably just me. I'm <laughs> but just like, kidding. You know, it does require following up until you hear it no, right? And so that's okay with one client, that's okay with 10, maybe 50. But 
you know, more than that, as the years grow, the loss in sales from not following up just continues to add up year after year. And it, it actually, it gets kind of embarrassing. Like after a while, like if you really think about if I converted 5% more sales just from following up more, like what would that mean? Year one, year two, year three. And it's, it can be, it can be significant. So then we hired an AE account executive, which is the same thing. Sounds like you have as well, Deanna. And, um, that person was doing demos. That person's, you know, closing inbound deals. Um, the difficulty there is though, they are also qualifying people that are reaching out to us as well. So, you know, someone fills out a contact form, someone reaches out via email, they're filling out that initial stuff. And maybe they're a customer, maybe they're not a customer. The sales development rep, the SDR, is now the, gonna be the filter for the AE. So the AE's job is literally just to, you know, uh, show people around and follow up and close them and get them passed over to an account manager. And so SDR, you know, qualifies, gets on the phone right away of which speaking of which the faster you get on the phone with someone, the faster, the, the higher the close rate is like literally if they fill out the form and you give them a call a minute, two minutes later, it's just exponentially higher than waiting, you know, two hours, let alone a day or two, because people are shopping around and then the last part is the account manager whose job is to retain and grow that account over time. And so we thought about it as like, it's like a, you're assembling a car. So you could have one person assembling the whole car, but it's going to take so long. So now if you split up the person who's doing like fabrication, the person who's doing, you know, electronics and the person who's, I don't know, painting the exterior, right? Now we can start moving a little bit quicker. How, how quickly um, did they pay themselves off, Bruce? How quickly did they did the revenue? Because you you went from one employee to three employees, mm -hmm. but you were hoping that your revenue would go to one to three x. Like, what was the payoff time? Well, we like, set up so so two things. Number one, there's a really good book called Predictable Revenue, and it's the and they're talking about the early time in Salesforce. And so Salesforce, you know, everyone's heard about it, and they have an incredible. Uh, sales team. <laughs> and one of the early things they did is hire two sales reps at the same time on the same team. And the reason was, is it's hard to understand if you just hire one person, how they compete and how they, how well they do with the rest of the team, hiring them at that time, right? There's ramp up, there's learning and so on. Hmm. You hire two and it becomes really clear. Someone's breaking off and the other person's not, not, not doing so hot. Um, and so when we did that, we were able to cut off the bad performer and keep the good one and then sub in another good one and to be able to understand that better. Hmm. Uh, so then we also said, so I calculated this out. I was also very worried about bringing someone on that I, it was hard to justify the profitability, which is kind of weird, right? If you think about it, because it's easier to bring on someone like in product or in your world in production or something like that. Cause it's like, yeah, they're doing, they're, they're moving this widget to that widget. But like the sales is probably the most measurable role in the organization to be able to bring someone on. And so I created this huge, Excel sheet of the sales funnel, the conversion, and literally the dollars of the steps going down. And then based on paying them monthly, how long it would take to pay that person off. And that estimate was between six to eight months, depending on hmm. their sales utilization. So like, you know, they're not that good month one. So call it zero to 10%. Then maybe it's 50% utilization. Then maybe it's 80%. Then it's 100%. Then maybe the next month's 80% because they take time off or whatever it is. And so that, that payoff period was six to eight months. Um, now this isn't infinitely scalable. There's only so many leads um, and so much demand you can generate in your area, but that was big. And I think when I mathematically proved it on a sheet, that was something I can hold to the person and say in the interview, Hey, look, I've built this. These are your goals. This is where I want to hold you to, to be able to grow. And it made me feel really comfortable about the financial end, right? Of of like, oh crap, like is this person gonna should, work? Uh, you not? should be a guest speaker at Sales Inc. Uh, Kevin should invite oh. you in. That was <laughs> profound. I'm sure, like, I'm sure <laughs> Kevin's like, Kevin, yeah, dude, this is like basics. What do you mean? You uh, should have done this day one. So Kevin, Kevin meets with our team uh, every so often, or when they're pissed at me, they just call Kevin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, what does Kevin say? Um, so anyway, so he was on a call with our team yesterday and we're, um, we're doing a lot of recruiting, which is a lot of like outbound outreach. 
and the way he said it, I was like, damn, that's, <laughs> that's everything I was thinking, but you just said it so much better. <laughs> and he was talking about like, yeah. So, uh, super, super interesting. I think my takeaway, Bruce, from that is, uh, shops are scared that, or we're fearful that we're going to just blow money for six to eight months with like, we're going to lose a bunch of money along the way. I think that's the like innate fear is, is that payback period. Um, Dan, is that what you think about is how long until they're, how long until it doesn't affect my profit anymore? Yeah. Um, because some learn faster than others. And so you just never know who's really going to click with it. Um, I, when we did, implement commission, it gave me an incredible insight into what um, people are capable of doing as far as sales. I did not know what that number was before. Um, it, it can be a range because, you know, you always have some that are just really good at it. And so they're, they're kind of at the top, you know, but it, it definitely gave me insight and to know what, what sales reps are capable of, at least at our shop. And, um, when it helps, helps me know when to rehire for more. Um, I like the idea of hiring too. And, that was smart. but then that makes me worry. Like, am I going to have enough work for them? Like that scares me at that, that point. Um, I super like the idea of having an account executive that like receives all of the incoming and then funnels it to the reps below, I definitely, that's been something I've been thinking a lot about is like, how do I help my sales team uh, be less stressed and do a better job, you know, because they have to think about so many things. Um, we do in screen printing, embroidery, heat pressing, we do promo products, uh, and stickers, banners. So we do a lot of things and they have a lot of stuff to cover and including online stores, um, Printabo merch. So, um, there's a lot for them to organize. Um, so I've been thinking about how to, you know, is it time to restructure that, that team? You mentioned one thing, um, that I want us to cover before we hop off really is sweet spots. So it's like, all right, if you could double sales, here's what I would do, but I don't really know if I want to double sales. And, I've actually heard something <laughs> similar, not in the word sweet spots, but like different shops who have really scaled a lot and gone past the, you know, three presses and four and five and so on. And they're like, you know, I kind of miss the days of two to three because we were most profitable. We had a small team. I didn't need middle management. We, we were just really crushing and able to cruise along there. And I think I swung past my sweet spot. How do you think about that? Like, do you, do you think that's where you're at now or are you almost there? Do you think maybe you've passed it? I feel like we're, we're kind of in that spot now and possibly I can't help but wonder if like uh, numbers help tell you where your sweet spot is for sure. I, I want to say that ours is probably going to be a good two and a half to three million is in that area. Um, wow. Congratulations. Do I, do I want to thank yeah, you? That's amazing. It's, it's gone. Well, um, do we want to go bigger than that? At that point, you have to just make those decisions and you have to increase your pricing or increase your minimum order quantities or be more choosy with your customers, um, to maintain that. So that'll be interesting. <laughs> you know, it'll just be like another, yeah, the goal be another to be driving profitability. Like would with the 2024 thought of, hey, let's kind of keep revenue the same, maybe grow a little bit, but let's grow the bottom line. Yeah, 100%. I'd love to do that. I want to pay my employees more. It is expensive here. Um, I want to pay them more. I don't have health insurance yet. So I want to be able to still offer those things. Um, so, you know, if we could increase that bottom line, then that gives us more opportunity to have stuff like that. I think what... I'm hearing you say is if you're going to grow the company, you have to be, there has to be a commitment to growth, right? Like running a two to $3 million company is by no means easy whatsoever, but you still have some like autonomy over the business and control. It's kind of like you can, you can see every part of it, 
the second you start climbing out of that and you say, okay, it's not about going to three and a half or four, it's about getting to five because you're going to have to start hiring HR, getting benefits, having middle management. And that middle layer of leadership is really expensive. And so you could actually add a million dollars of revenue and make less money than you did today. Um, and so when you start, when you become committed to growth, you kind of can't stop for a little bit. You have to like, it's like a rocket going through the atmosphere. You have to like keep going through it. Um, and that's a really scary part for businesses. I think that's where a lot of businesses sometimes look at it and say, not for me, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's totally respectable too. Right. Um, I don't know. That's Bruce, interesting. What do you see? I wonder if those, do you think, do you guys think that there's a calculator of based on the city population, right? Which I think kind of sort of directly correlates with the amount of business that there is in sort of the regional area based on the population. Is there a revenue number that when you hit this, it's kind of like a bend. It's like, if, yeah, if you keep, if you a, pass is this bend, bend Oregon, is that a bend <laughs> Oregon reference? No pun intended. If, if you pass this bend, you're going to have to swing to the next mountaintop, right? And you have to be prepared for that. And that's cool. But just so you know, like you're like, maybe it's $2 million and that's where you can really optimize profitability based on cost of wages and metro area and uh, population and, and all that. Bruce and I uh, went to, Bend on a ski trip. Oh, once you didn't come visit. Uh, uh, what was it Mount Bachelor? Yeah, right. Yeah, and um, Bruce is a great friend sometimes, except when you fly into Portland in the <laughs> middle of a snowstorm <laughs> at midnight and you have to get a rental car and uh, drive to Bend, which is a long drive, it's like four hours. And because uh, <laughs> because Bruce wants to get first chair out the next morning. And so, you know, your good friend that goes with you on these trips does this four hour drive while everyone in the car sleeps through a snowstorm, through the mountains. I was trying to stay awake. He's like, let's record we a podcast. Actually, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, I was trying uh, to record the, the podcast and every time I'd ask a question, I'd fall asleep. He'd fall asleep and I'd be like, Gosh. white knuckle, try to drive. And so we finally get there at 4 a.m. And then Bruce is like, all right, like, uh, wake you up at seven. I'm like, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our story about Bend, Oregon. And, uh, we went to Bend, Oregon in sweet lot. spots. And there was yeah. a huge snowstorm. It was amazing. Um, Bruce has some funny footage of me almost falling in a tree hole. Um, uh, yeah. Anyways, I, di I digress. Uh, your shop is like, it's pretty cool to watch and it's, it's, I would almost put it in a picture frame and shops would look at it and say like, that is a pretty dream shop of, of how you do things, how you take care of your people, you know, uh, even looking behind this first time I've seen these bar charts and I'm not really surprised. Um, what, what keeps you up at night now? Like what, yeah. What, what, what keeps you up at night? Not having proper procedures and stuff in place still, um, I still get frustrated if I see a sticky note hanging somewhere. I'm like, how can we expect anybody else to come in and, and quickly learn and be efficient at their job and good at their job if we don't have this stuff in place. So that kind of stuff um, keeps me up. It's definitely something that I think about a lot and try and work on. Um, and how to how to get my evolve the team into that mindset so it's not just on me anymore. Um, we're gonna. We're going to do our first uh, offsite kind of day things um, inspired by you guys. So that's going to we'll be next skiing. month. Yeah, come skiing. <laughs> uh, come in the summertime too and surf. And uh, so those kind of things are really on my mind a lot. Just I'm constantly thinking how to be more efficient, makes people's jobs easier. Um, ultimately, I'd like to have some kind of exit plan in the next five years. Um, whether, you know, that would most likely involve like our oldest daughter who's in sales right now to like kind of oversee that transition. Um, but I want everything just in place for her. I don't want it to be hard, you know, because I know how hard it is. And, um, and so there's going to have to be a good team and a good structure and good procedures and things in place. And so that's on my mind a ton. Um, making sure this place just runs efficiently as possible. Man, it's, it, it feels like things are evolving fast, especially with AI. 
just like Matt Marcotte, slow down. I can't, I can't keep up anymore. <laughs> he is, he is a, a damn innovation hammer right Man. now. With the, yeah, yeah. Great like every ideas. week. What yeah. the heck, dude? I but, didn't even get a chance to look at this yet. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done the last stuff yet. So, yeah. um, I feel like just trying to keep up and not not get lost in the times, not let our shop become old. You know, making sure it's always fresh and current. How do you do that? And and things move so fast. People want things fast. They they're shopping online. How do I keep up with that? So you could say a few things keep, or keep me up at night. <laughs> well, you're doing an awesome job. Um, Thank you. And in our conversations, the challenges that you're trying to like these are like good good challenges, and mm-hmm. I think it'll be cool to see where you're all at in a year or two. Um, so this yeah. is super neat because I know you're dabbling in like some licensing stuff and there's some, there's some other things for another day <laughs> <laughs> for another day. Yeah. Uh, but, but this is, this is amazing. Okay. Um, for those listening that want to follow you, what are your different Instagram handles? Yeah. Instagram um, is where you find me the most. That's uh, my true self print shop life. Um, you can find me there. I, I'm in Facebook, um, usually just in the print girl mafia group. Um, highly encourage any, uh, females in the industry, um, regardless if you're, you're in embroidery or sales or you're an owner, no matter what, just that's, it's a great group, um, to be involved in and, and ask questions. And, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it where you'll find me. Sweet. And then your shop's In The Zone, Inc. on Instagram? In The Zone, Inc. on Instagram. No I, just the letter N. <laughs> and uh, it's in Bend, Oregon. Um, our website is ntzink.com. Nice. Cool. Awesome. Deanna, thanks so much for being able to join us. Uh, Pronouncers, we appreciate you guys joining us as well. And guess what? Cleveland, Ohio has been announced. The Made Lab team has announced the Print Hustlers Conf will be in Cleveland, Ohio next year. Go to printhustlers.com. You could grab some tickets. You could check it out. It's going to be a great time. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much for listening. Hopefully that was informative. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to hit the bell for notifications if you enjoyed this video. If you enjoy all the stuff we're putting out, it's really helpful. We love to just be able to see it. That means that we're doing a good job. To subscribe, hit the bell for notifications and hit the like button. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.